Okay, uh, Richard, my one big thing this week, I'll just jump right into it. Um, you know I can't resist this topic, Saudi Golf. There's a new <laughs> podcast out from Golf Digest. It really does a great job at giving the history of Greg Norman's pursuit to shake up the game. Um, as you both know, Saudi Arabia announced last fall it would be partnering up with Greg Norman, the shark, for a $200 million venture called Live Golf Investments to increase the popularity of the game outside the U.S. and Europe. Um, Greg Norman is Liv's chief executive officer. Um as you both might know, this is the latest Saudi back effort. Um, it isn't Norman's first pony ride at the county fair. Uh, Norman <laughs> tried unsuccessfully to start a competing tour in the 90s. And a, the, the podcast really captures why Norman was doing it then and how a few folks in the PGA successfully torpedoed the plans. It's just like a really interesting look at what was going on then and what, what Greg Norman is doing now. The podcast also features an interview with Norman himself. It sort of changed the way how I'm thinking about this, mostly in that I believe Norman in that he's doing this to grow the game of golf and solve some long-standing problems with the PGA. Uh, for example, Norman believes that the PGA's insistence on not having appearance fees and tightly regulating where players can play is stunting the growth of the sport. Uh, the PGA decided to kick the can down the road this spring and grant waivers to a host of the sport's biggest names to play in the upcoming Saudi International. So we'll have to wait to see, um, way to break the popcorn out um, on the PGA versus Saudi League. Um, sort of head-to-head -head battle coming up. Anyway, highly suggest that you check it out. It's on golfdigest.com, but we also have it on our website, sustg.com. Um, Dave, do you play golf? Not well. I play about twice a year, um, and usually I like to play, you know, it's, it's more, you know, more of the Churchillian and a good walk spoiled. But uh, <laughs> I was thinking about getting into golf serious. But the problem is it's so time consuming and expensive. Mm -hmm. So I decided to smoke crack instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I love golf. I really would like to play more and, I, and, and I'm trying to play more, but I'm not very good at it. And it just occurs to me I might be better at smoking crack. So, Dave, let's. <laughs> let's <laughs> it's cheaper. <laughs> You know um, <clears throat> that um, that episode was good, and and, and uh, Greg Norman, uh, I agree with what you said, Lucian. You know, but uh, Greg Norman still holds a grudge. We know he does, and it's been interesting to watch this whole process where uh, you know the Saudis talked about uh, doing this this Super League, and then um, went ahead and invested in the Asian uh, Asian League, and it's. Um, and then the PGA partnering with the, the now the, the Dubai Ports League, but it was a Europe, European circuit, in order to really compete and and meet some of these uh, desires of their top flight players. So they're all sort of meeting in the middle. It's all coming up, and and the Saudi vision in this this Super League that was envisioned and has sort of come to the fore a couple of times is is clearly going to win the day, in my opinion. Because we're going to have more of these very large, high purse events with you know just the top performers, who are getting appearance fees, which is sort of the format that everyone's talking about. So yeah. it's 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 been an interesting process to see it go. Yeah, it's kind of like I, I I think what we're going to see is golf is going to become sort of like the F one, but if you had alternate circuits of F one where. Um, you know, people come to uh, you know Manama and other places, uh, but they don't do it for free. And I think there's right. a recognition, the Saudis recognize that uh, they're going to have to have a sort of a top down approach uh, for a while, at least before the game takes root. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's encouraging. I mean, um, uh, you know, sport, yeah, pe people talk about all the industrial goals for Vision 2030, but one of them is that every Saudi is going to exercise on a regular basis. You know, people neglect that, that social aspect of Vision 2030. And, you know, anything that promotes sport is 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 a good thing. Um, and, yeah, you know, I wish I golfed more and I wish I golfed better. Uh, you know, I've, I've only <laughs> I've only played three holes in the kingdom, so I look forward to doing it again. <laughs> Dave, you're clearly a regular listener of the 966, because we often talk about the um, the quality of life plank of the Vision 2030, that yeah. uh, quality of life pillar and that uh, participation and how uh, these uh, sports uh, initiatives that, uh, you know, get the front pages and that sort of thing. We're talking all the way from Newcastle and soccer to golf to Formula One. You know, they, they, they are criticized for being sports washing, for sports washing, but the, how it ties back into uh, real goals back home in terms of participation and health and, and finding outlets for their youth. 
uh, and I will say this: if if the you know if the golf if the golf what you know the Asian Tour or even the PGA could have a season exciting as this last F1 season, which was yeah. insanely exciting. Then uh, that's must see TV. That would really build their their base. Yeah, no, it's good. You know, people people tend to regard sports and politics and social development as separate, but they really are um, fundamentally entwined. You know, you look at the battle for racial integration in the United States, and there's a reason why you know Jackie Robinson's number is retired at every professional baseball team. And then conversely, on the negative side, if you look at um, the birth of modern Quebec independence. It goes back to the Montreal Canadiens. Um, <laughs> riots after uh, uh, Rocket Richard was unjustly suspended for an alleged dirty hit. Uh, you know, that led to a, um, uh, a riot in Montreal in the 50s. And, and most Canadian historians, and I realize we're delving into a very, very obscure area when you talk about Excellent. anything with Canada being significant. But the... the um, political ferment that led to modern Quebec secessionism, you know, martial law in, in uh, Montreal in the 70s. They, they stem that all from that hockey match. So it can be significant, and I think the kingdom's wise to focus on it. Yeah, agreed. It's interesting, too. It, it, Norman's whole point about the appearance fees thing is, like, if you're starting up a new league and you're starting up a new tournament and it's in a place where golf typically is not terribly popular or there really isn't a lot, large fan base for the sport. Yeah. You need to pay people to show up. And part of the reason why you do that is because that then gets people to attend the events. It gets, you know, sponsors and interest. It sort of generates its own money back when you're doing that. It's just a good way to get things started. So for Saudi Arabia or Indonesia or any of these other countries to do this is like, you know, it's an important way for them to get things going. So it's interesting to see the players sort of come back and forth across the spectrum on this. Some people saying, look, I don't want to do politics. I don't care. I'm going to play in Saudi Arabia and take the money. And others are saying, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know uh, about where the money's coming from. I, I'm, I'm worried about this and that. It's like the, the players are independent contractors. They can sort of do what they want. And that's the, that's the essence of the battle right now. And that's sort of why I thought that was interesting with that podcast, just talking about that angle of it. Because I think that is Greg yeah. Norman's like number one thing that he's working on. It was interesting yeah. back in the day when he first mooted this in the mid '90s. Uh, it was basically kibosh by Arnold Palmer. Yeah, so, you, know, uh, you know we, you know Jack and and uh, Gary Player and I were the threesome, and, and we didn't. Everyone invited us to go out on our own and do our own little bit, and we didn't because we didn't think it'd be good for the game. The game has changed. Yeah, um, and I actually, but I actually think there's, we're going to be coming to a head at some point because the PGA is going to have to either a, a cave. Or they're going to have to try and draw a line in the sand, and then and then these independent contractors, and it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, I mean, basically, what you're describing is not too different from the PGA Seniors Tour, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, that is, you know, not a hyper competitive league, and it's fan driven, and there's appearance fees and stuff like that. So, you know, we already have sort of a precedent there within the domestic context. So I don't think it'd be that hard to export the model. And, and clearly it, it meshes nicely with what the kingdom is seeking to do for uh, both enhancing its its stage, giving it a reputation as a place to actually go to for something other than business. And yeah, I think, you know, what yeah. the heck? I mean, more golf is better. I, you know, you know, there have been wars over soccer games, but there's never been a war over <laughs> golf. <laughs> well, it, 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 back to Saudi, I mean, Aramco is, has, is very much involved in the Ladies European Tour. And, mm -hmm. and so they're, they're trying to build the sport across the, you know, the genders in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, yeah. and it's not just men. Uh, so it, it's, and, you know, and the, back to the PGA, they just put in this player impact program, which is a $40 million pool. Mm -hmm. which Phil Mickelson got $8 million for this year, you know, Jeez. for for basically what, because it's, again, it's in response to what the, the, the these leagues, the competitive leagues are saying is you have to pay your marquee players. And so they said, all right, here's a 40 million pot and we'll have some, some quotient that lets us know who has you know, done the most to promote the game of golf. And, and again, so Phil, just for being Phil, you know, got 5% of that 40 million. To add to is, I'm sure is, I'm sure it was a really scraggly year. He didn't make enough money, so another eight million. <laughs> you know, my mother lives in La Jolla in San Diego, and Phil Mickelson owns all the Five Guys. 
<laughs> <laughs> and, and I can tell you, whenever, whenever um, my, my mom gives me like a, uh, and she she golfs occasionally, uh, she plays Tory Pines and all that. Uh, wow. Whenever whenever she gives me, well, it's a municipal golf course in San Diego. If you live in San Diego, it's affordable. And whenever she gives me clothes, I can always tell that basically the. The picture she has in her mind's eye is Phil Mickelson. <laughs> she wants me to look like Phil Mickelson. <laughs> well, so, well, look. So I and, resent him. <laughs> and well, until his recent diet, and he he looked like he frequented those five guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Not not just the owner, but a customer. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ooh. I stand by my product. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dave, I have just one more follow up question. Where did you play your three holes in Saudi Arabia? Uh, at a residential compound in Riyadh. Cool. Why only three yeah, holes? Uh, well, it's a schedule, time, and uh, apparently you, you're supposed to pay green fees, and I thought it was free. So uh, <laughs> when I saw somebody coming my way, I hightailed it in the opposite direction. <laughs> I was I was basically – but, you know, I mean, that, that brings out a good point about golf and why it may be good for the kingdom. You know, if you're trying to do – you know, like Dubai has gone in big for cricket, but you know, you got to have 22 players right. to play cricket golf. You can play by yourself. Women can play against men. You hit off the different tees. The handicap system allows, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like skiing, you know, you're really playing against the course, uh, you know, and, and so theoretically with a handicap, a gifted amateur can play against a professional. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's an, there's an ecological argument against golf, but um, in terms of participation and broadening it, 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 it really, uh, paradoxically, for such an expensive sport, once you get onto the greens, it's it's actually a very democratic sport that transcends uh, gender and everything else like that. So I think it's a, you know, there's a lot to be said for it. And it's a lifetime sport. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, an old guy like me can go out and, you and know, me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can defile courses anywhere around the world until I die. <laughs> yeah, I'll be I'll be hacking up divots until I'm ninety. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>